right, hey, welcome back to Mechanical Pros. Here with Brian. Today we're talking about airflow restrictions, refrigerant restrictions, how to troubleshoot, diagnose. Great to be with you, Brian. Yep. Thank you. Tell me what's going on. Yeah, folks, so we're going to talk today about uh, what you would look for if you ran across a unit. Maybe your evaporator coil was frozen up or the customer had been complaining of such things and you show up on the job and how to go about troubleshooting the two most likely causes for that, which would be airflow restrictions or a restriction in your refrigerant circuit, which would typically be on your liquid line side. So first we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what it would be with airflow and why does an evaporator coil freeze up? So you've got your gauges here, the nice analog set, which everybody should have. On the inside ring of your analog gauges is temperatures. On the outside ring is going to be your pressure. So this particular set will do 22 or 410A. Two different rings in there, the pink being the 410A and the green being the R22. And there's corresponding numbers across from each one of them. So as your gauge goes up, you just read where that needle's laying across on the temperature side and that tells me what the temperature of the refrigerant inside this coil is. And if it is below 32 degrees, well, we're below freezing. So then any humidity that gets drawn across that coil will start frosting to the coil. And as time goes on, it'll just build up and ice up. And we've all seen that. And if it goes long enough, believe it or not, which many guys have seen, it works its way all the way back to the compressor. And your compressor could be a huge block of ice. It, it gets pretty ugly if they run too long. And it can slug your compressor with liquid and kill a compressor, something as simple as a dirty air filter could kill your compressor. So that's the most obvious thing to look for first. We're gonna talk about airflow restrictions first, the air filter. Make sure we've got a clean air filter. This particular unit we're using for the demo is a little Daikin mini split, a little different one than you're gonna see in the conventional setup, but it's a great little cutaway for us to use. Next thing I'd wanna check after my coil had thawed out is make sure the evaporator coil's clean. If the coil's dirty, it does the same thing as a dirty air filter, restricts the airflow. Once you verify those two things, which are nice, easy things to just visually check while you're letting it thaw out, then we go want to go ahead and put our gauges on the unit, start it up after everything's thawed and it's ready to run, and we're going to check refrigerant pressures to determine a couple other things as well. We can pretty much nail it down whether it's refrigerant or airflow just by using our gauges. So once I hook my gauges up, I need to look on my data plate of my condenser and it's going to give me a target subcooling. That should tell me if I've got a really close refrigerant charge. If say the target subcooling says 12 degrees, we should be plus or minus three degrees of that. So nine to 15, if we're five degrees subcooling, I'm undercharged. If we're you know 20 degrees, I'm overcharged. So the best way to tell if I've got a normal subcool, when I hook up to this, okay, my refrigerant charge is good, but then I look at my gauges and my saturated evaporator temperature is below freezing. That is a direct indication of airflow. That is not a refrigerant issue. That's gonna be an airflow issue. I can now stop chasing my tail on refrigerant and focus back on airflow. I've gone through and I've made sure that my indoor coil's clean. I've made sure my filter's clean. I've rolled those two things up. There could be a couple more. My blower wheel or my blower motor could be the issue. Maybe the blower motor is starting to fail or maybe it's set at the wrong speed and it's not moving enough air. That can cause the problem. Your blower wheel or your squirrel cage, as people will call it, has got cupped blades in it. If over time, if it's a 20 plus year old unit, those cups will get filled with dirt and now it's not throwing as much air. That could be just a simple maintenance issue to fix. So that's, that's the main things I look for in airflow. Once I've rolled all that out, then we need to start looking at duct work. If everything else was good, it's gonna take me to my return duct. And we need to find out, do we have a restriction in the return duct? Has something happened? One of the best tools you got in your tool bag is communication with the customer. Has this always been an issue? Has this just happened? You know, go ahead and ask some questions like that. If it's always been an issue, it's probably from the install. It was never installed right, mm -hmm. which would lead you to probably put the wrong size duct work. Mm -hmm. Maybe they had a two ton unit and they put a three ton in and didn't change. That'll cause those problems. So. Some, a little bit of investigation on the front end will help save you some time too. If you were to come across it and the duct work on the return side is too small, you could temporarily open up a section of it, put a little pleated filter over it or something to keep stuff getting dirty, introduce more air into that, and that'll help you get you by until you can find a permanent solution. So I've gone through and I've ruled out that it is not an airflow issue. So now I'll go back. It's, I'm thinking I've got a liquid line restriction of some type. So there's a few places that can be. It could be in my liquid line dryer it could be in my TXV. 
It could be the sensing bulb on my TXV or the TXV itself could be clogged. So what I usually like to check first is, you know, I've got my gauges hooked up and everything. I'm going to go ahead and check my liquid line dryer. Got the unit running, everything's thawed out. Take a temperature drop across either side of that liquid line dryer and make sure it's not more than a couple degrees. If you see a five plus degree swing on that, that guy's restricted. That's probably causing your problem. If that all looks good, then we need to start looking at our TXV. Now this is a larger TXV for a 10 ton unit, so it won't be quite this big, but it will have these same components. It'll have a sensing bulb on it. This sensing bulb is going to be strapped off to your refrigerant piping and it's got an orientation that it's supposed to be on the pipe so we need to make sure that's all. I believe it's the 9 o'clock or 3 o'clock position on the pipe. It should be strapped off securely and insulated. If you walk up to it and it's got a wire tie on it, that's probably your problem. So we need to make sure that's oriented correctly. If it is, okay, the other thing it could be, sometimes this little tube will get a hole rubbed in it. This has its own refrigerant charge, and as it heats up or cools down, it changes the pressure in this refrigerant, which affects a diaphragm in this valve and drives the valve open or closed. So we need to make sure this sensing bulb has not lost its charge. Visual check at first. Looks all good. Doesn't mean it doesn't have a tiny hole you can't see. Next good test to do is remove the sensing bulb off the pipe while the unit's running and hold it in your hand. So we're going to be changing it now from probably 45 degrees, you know, to 90 plus, you should see a dramatic change on your gauges pretty quickly. If you do that for a few minutes and it never changes, sensing bulbs bad. Next and really the only other thing you're going to have is if perhaps they, someone has done a repair before you and they didn't properly clean the system up, there is a filter screen inside this valve. And if it gets full of carbon, maybe they didn't purge when they brazed or some trash got in there. A good tell for that is instead of flowing refrigerant all the time like it should, it'll sort of be spraying it out. So it'll still be working, but not moving enough refrigerant like it should. So again, rule out the dryer first, rule out the uh, sensing bulb before you go to diagnose a bad TXV. This is a very common misdiagnosis as a TXV. A lot of guys will see a refrigerant issue and they'll immediately go to the TXV. 50-50 shot. What do you I recommend to mount the, um, the sensing bulb with? It comes with metal straps and then I call it cork tape. It's an insulation tape, real gummy type of insulation. Put your sensor bulb in the right position. The metal straps go around it, snug it down tight, and then really wrap it with that cork tape. You could use Armaflex if you wanted to and, and wire ties over top of it. Just make sure it's really secure on there and it's insulated really good so it's only picking up the temperature of that pipe. And the reason they want you to orient it on the pipe is because it's trying to get kind of a little bit of a liquid temp so it can mm -hmm. really get a good reading on what that temperature is. And if you're going to pull it out, you just cut it out with a knife and, yeah. and then put it back on. That's it. a good point. This cork tape's great, but it's a bit messy. So be patient, dull your knife up. But yeah, go ahead and cut that off. Then loosen your brackets, pull it off, reuse the brackets and the cork tape will stick back together. So even after you mm -hmm. cut it, you can kind of mash it back together. That's what's kind of cool about it. But yeah, for sure, take it off good, clean it up. And when you go to reapply it, sand the pipe down real good. So you're getting a good surface connection mm -hmm. there. And you were, we were talking about vibration. Yeah, because it'll come all like that in the box, right? Mm -hmm. I want to stretch that thing out and make sure these rings aren't really touching each other. They're not laying up against any metal on the cabinet. If possible, give that plenty of free space and then mm -hmm. you're not going to worry about it. If you walk up to one and it's all jammed in there, there's a good chance that's it. If you do diagnose one, when you get back to change it, one thing I always like to do is take my side cutters and clip that. And if I hear gas come out of it, I just misdiagnose that sensing bulb because there is a little charge and you'll audibly hear the gas come out when you clip it with your cutter. So mm -hmm. just a good way to know, okay, I'm going to change this valve, but that's not really what the problem was. Yeah. And then um, also we talked a little bit about heating and restricted airflow. So just like you can have a frozen coil and not get cooling because you've got a restriction for some reason, same thing in the heating mode. If we're not moving the proper amount of air across our heat exchanger, or our electric heat strips, there's a high limit switch in our unit that doesn't want that to get too hot for safety reasons. If it senses it getting too hot, the switch trips and shuts your heat off. If you run into that, filter's dirty, that's probably what the problem was. Again, ask the customer, has this always happened? First time it's happened, the filter's dirty, that's what it was. Clean the filter, go reset the switch. Check it, stay with it a while and make sure that was exactly the fact. And some of those high limit switches will automatically reset and some are Most manual. Most of them in residential will, when you start getting in like commercial, a lot of times they're manual reset, you'll have to actually open the unit up, but most of the time they'll reset. Mm -hmm.
in residential. Um, that's about it. I mean, just, you know, read your data plate on your condenser to get your subcooling targets. And then, um, like I said, we will, we're making several other videos talking about how to properly check subcooling and superheats. If you've got any questions about that, you can just come back and see us on it. But uh, just make sure you know what you're looking for before you hook up and start just running in circles. You, yeah. you really need to know what the design is. I could give you a ballpark number for any unit, but everyone's going to have its own specific subcool there. So yeah. you want to know what you're looking for before you get started. All right. Well, thanks, Brian. Always good to be with you. Great. Hey, thanks for checking us out on Mechanical Pros. Come back, hit that like, hit the subscribe, and we'll check you out next time.